Good day, everybody. The topic in question today, rural interventions, do's and don'ts, is extremely relevant to this day and age. Because chest physicians, interventional pulmonologists, are more aggressive and enthusiastic than ever before. However, one cannot deny that these procedures are not in, a, invasive as they enter the human body through incisions, not very different from surgery. I'm here surrounded by hordes of pulmonologists and meekly I shall brave this discussion. First, do no harm. Experience is the teacher of all things. This becomes very significant as with time, we learn from our mistakes. It is only wise to ever remind us of the Hippocratic Oath. Further, I will comport myself and use my knowledge in a godly manner. I will not cut for the stone, but will commit that affair entirely to the surgeons. Very do not treat on others chose. Better to be discreet than become brave and courageous. Keeping the above guidelines in our minds, a reasonable line of thinking emerges as to the expertise required for pleuroscopy, thoracoscopy, and bats. Various guidelines have been formulated by different bodies of individual countries. The effort here is to focus and make some sense of all this and give out some indications and expertise required for the benefit of the patient. To avoid confusion, some authors suggest that medical thoracoscopy should be referred to as pleuroscopy. Okay. The term thoracoscopy may be used exclusively for the surgical thoracoscopic procedure, very well delineated. Now, the horizon widens in thoracoscopy and may be divided subdivided into level one, that's pleuroscopy, and advanced procedures. Level three could be bats. Now, contraindications do exist, circumferential adherent pleura, inability to lie spine, limited cardiopulmonary reserve to tolerate a pneumothorax, severe respiratory disease unrelated to effusion, severe hypercapnia that's about 60. Related contraindications are hypoxemia, recent MI or stroke, coagulopathies, obstructive central airway tumors, morbid obesity, and importantly, inability to tolerate lateral decubitus positioning, but even more is the lack of multidisciplinary thoracic surgeons or anesthetists. This is very essential. An operator should have done a minimum of 20 cases under supervision, this choice, whether rigid or flexible. CT scan is imperative, so is USD chest today. It helps in distinguishing and identifying pneumothorax as well as loculated effusions. The indications are workup and diagnosis of idiopathic pleural effusions, staging of lung cancer, pleurodesis, site-directed, biopsy of parietal pleura, and staging of mesothelioma. Non-hemorrhagic effusions are seen in tuberculosis. This patient also we could not get a diagnosis or fetch a diagnosis. Went in as you as see non-hemorrhagic but large deposits of tissue metastasis on the parietal pleura and lung surface. Mesothelia might can occur as a complete replacement of the pleura with nodules. Now, when we do pleurodesis, it will fail. And why does that happen? There should be even distribution of the sclerosing agent, popularly talc, over all the pleural surface, as well as on the inside of the chest wall. And if there is a large tumor burden with low pleural pH, it's going to fail. Previous thoracic irradiation and a long-standing chest tube are also contributory factors. Rheumatoid arthritis, 
as is seen in this patient here, undiagnosed effusion, now a paired strap lung, and a cavity, all in favor of tuberculosis. But this is what we found. The parietal surface had gritty appearance and many small vesicles or granules, as is seen here. Mesothelioma, the parks are huge. And when resected or dissected out, they appear as sheets. Pneumothorax, the BTS and HCCP have given out very specific guidelines. Chemical pluralises can control difficult or regular pneumothoraces, but since surgical options are more effective, it should only be used if a patient is either unwilling or unable to undergo surgery. Recurrence is almost unheard of following attacks. Complications in level one, rare. Let's move on to level two advanced procedures. Very few centers in the world are doing it. Multiple punctures are required. It enables us to visualize the costal vertebral angle, mediastinal pleural surfaces, and the lung apex. Remember, level two procedures may be performed by experienced level one practitioners and depends solely on the operator's skill. The indications are thoracoscopy of small effusions, biopsy of visceral pleura, division of adhesions in pleural infection, pinch lung biopsy, empyema, decortication, and maybe sympathetic. Adhesions and its divisions. These, in this particular case, it's pretty easy and convenient. It's at the apex. But however, when we go down in the same case, it gets more dense and adherent. Herein, we have tried to release the lung very stuck closely. As you can see, it did cause damage and leak. There it is, it has gone into the lung surface and injury. So one has to be cautious in dense adhesions. Now, before the advent of staplers, we used to do lung biopsies uh, for ILD as well. Here we have effusion, undiagnosed effusion, went in, and that was a worm like appearance, what we saw earlier. We took a biopsy from there, and it turned out to be tumor emboli in arterioles from a poorly differentiated possible use in secreting adenocarcinoma. And this is the cauterized area after the biopsy. Paranumonic effusions, here you know, straightforward effusion. Uh, lights classification one, classification two, fibrinous adhesions and more dense adhesions. The stage three, that would require definitely a surgeon's role. And there we go in, in that last case we mentioned. A lot of empyema, adhesions, deloculation was required, and finally, a decortication, wherein the parietal pleura is dissected off. It is a painful procedure for the surgeons. It takes a long time, and this is the result one should achieve, both not only on chest x-ray, but also on CT scan. Please follow it up the CT scan. Then you have a better idea of what you have done in and how good your outcome is. Level two complications are more. BPF could occur, hemorrhage, subcutaneous emphysema, post-operative fever, empyema, and which could be life-threatening. These procedures may be best left to surgeons who regularly performs them with higher levels of competency. Let's, let's look briefly look at what the surgeons do. Stapled lung biopsy, lobectomy, resection of benign or malignant peripheral pulmonary nodules, transthoracic vagotomy, creation of a pericardial window, ablation of sympathetic trunk, repair of BPF, evaluation of mediastinal tumors or adenopathy, and maybe followed up with a small utility incision to remove the lesion depending on the size. Now stapling can be done for lung biopsies as well as for a solitary pulmonary lesion and urine, one is seen grasping the, uh, the target area, 
brought in between staplers, staplers fired, and the specimen excised. Sometimes we need multiple samples to get complete control of air leak. Cardiac tamponade, the heart here is beneath this layer. That's a pericardium, very dense. Uh, with great difficulty, we puncture it. And this is what we find, a fountain. A heart was in the mouth, had been really gone into the ventricle, but thankfully not because it was not blood, it was not thick as one would visualize or expect. We proceed further to do a pericardial window. And in this case, we have pericardial effusion, multiple plural loculated effusions too. Identify the phrenic nerve, go anterior to it, get an avascular area by cautery, make a neck, get hold of the pericardium, suck out all the fluid, use the suction to break any loculations within the pericardial cavity. Wide excision of the generous excision of the pericardium is done so as to get a pericardial window thereafter. Now in bulla, we get inside the pleural cavity, this water of bulla appears very at adherent places that can be released easily but sometimes it becomes more challenging as seen earlier. You can see thickened blood vessels on the pleura, identify the base, fire the stapler, and at times we need to attend to plebs, which can be cauterized effectively. And there you see the bulla, excised bulla, inflated with air, let's see the difference between the blue blebs and bulla. Here you see blood vessels on the surface. It's very clear. Air-filled space, no tissues within it, unlike a blue bulla when it's open. Preferable to complete a bullectomy and prevent further recurrence, recurrence is to do a pleurectomy. A very delicate procedure. Could be morbid because there could be a lot of oozing. If you go deep, bleeding is caused, and here are sheets and sheets of it can be removed. This gentleman, a 105-year-old person, benefited from bats because he came in with surgical emphysema and we could size a BPF as well as give him relief. Important to differentiate or discriminate between an alveolar pleural leak. This is tiny. This would eventually probably close off within a week or 10 days, as opposed to a bronchopleural fistula where in a lab Lung abscess is ruptured. Uh, once opened, identified the bulla, instilled saline, ask our friends across the barrier, the anesthetist to inflate, and you can see the air leak. And this was the bulla down here, turned out to be a five millimeter one. Sometimes the BPF could become a bronchopleural Cutaneous fistula, and this is how it looks like. Oral fibromas can also be accessed through bats quite easily. And oral lipomas, not very common, but they can become nearly one, one and a half kilos of fat could was removed, it can be very painful to the patient. Endometriosis, here we see endometrial tissue on the diaphragm. So pleurectomy and excision of that tissue gives benefit to the patient. Uh, hyperhidrosis can be dealt with by identifying the sympathetic chain and dividing it. This was a case of end-stage pneumonia uh, caused by various bugs. The patient was having multiple pneumothoraces, so we went in to see what was happening. Pylothorax can be challenging. We are the fluid clear the pleural cavity, and then identify the thoracic duct, staple it proximally, as seen here, another one distally, and then divide it, and the entire length could easily be delivered. So to summarize, we've seen all three levels, 
the primary objective of medical thoracoscopy is diagnosis, pleurodesis, or both. That's level one. No worries, no mortality. One, the operator can see, sleep safely and soundly at home. Advanced procedures, level two, are performed in very few centers. It depends entirely on the skills of the operator. Extreme caution needs to be exercised. And please have a thoracic surgeon supporting and backing you up. In contrast, the primary purpose of video assisted thoracoscopic surgery is to perform minimally invasive thoracic surgery with minimal morbidity. 